What's cracking, big dog? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Happy Monday. Great start to the week. Feeling blessed that you are joining me on a Monday, right? What a be what better way, what worse way to start your week off, to be honest with you. But I'm glad you guys are here. And I also want to preface by saying I'm filming this on the Thursday prior to the Monday. So if we hear some shit about these players over the weekend, what are you going to do? Besides absolutely roast me in the comment section. Those are some of my favorite comments, by the way, especially the bold prediction one from last week when I'm out here agreeing with, with Nick from Fantasy Football Advice, Antonio Brown ends up on 20% of championship rosters. And then like two seconds later, we get a report that Antonio Brown has retired from the NFL. And then everyone's in the comment section like, should we tell him that he retired? I'm like, bitch, should I tell you that he's retired four times already this year? That just means whatever team was talking to him did not want to sign him. Yesterday came out that Antonio Brown still wants to play in the NFL. He's like a fucking boxer at this point. He just retires and unretires for the sake of doing it, for the sake of press. Any press is good press for Antonio Brown. At least that's the way it works in his head at this point. That's literally the opposite of true for him right now, because the only press that comes out now is like psychotic press. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about polarizing players for 2020 fantasy football. With that dumb intro concluded, y'all know what to do. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. Stop yelling, for real. Stop yelling. And let's eat. I'm also kind of in a conundrum that I, I might need your guys' help for. The Abe Lincoln poster is made out of metal. I forget what the company is called, but they make all their posters out of metal. The Einstein, the Abe Lincoln one and you put like a magnet up against the wall and it literally kept falling down and taking down my skateboard shelf. And I'm like, listen, bitch, you're up there to be a shelf, not to do tricks, know your role. So I had to move the Abe Lincoln down there. And now I want to put this other picture. See, these are Steve's parents. This is his mom. That's definitely not his mom. That's his dad. That's his mom. They're repping big dog's gear. It's my best friend's parents and they're repping my gear and it's my favorite fucking picture of all time. And I want to put it up there. But this is made out of like plastic with a layer of, I just don't know how the fuck to hang it. Like, how do I hang this? You, you can't drill through it. I'm thinking about getting really strong double-sided tape and just taping it to the wall, but I'm afraid it's just going to fall and knock the plants down and shit too. So any of you people good with woodwork, I should probably just ask Animal to be honest with you. You built the whole damn table. The table's finally done. As you can see, we've cleared out my apartment. As there's no wood bike there anymore. We're all set. So we could start rearranging the actual upstairs and I could start living here like a normal human being again. Okay, I'm going off the rocker on this Monday morning. Also, I'm filming with, uh, with Matt Kelly this week, I believe Wednesday, so going on the Roto Underworld podcast. I'm a big fan of that podcast, so it's pretty cool that I finally get to, to go on it and do battle with Mr. Matthew Kelly, one of my favorite podcasters in the space. That show, will I'm not sure how he does his editing, so it's either going to be this week's show or the week after, but stay tuned for that. If you don't know what podcast I'm talking about, it's one of the best dynasty podcasts in the world right now, so I'll link that down below. Make sure you subscribe, and if you're on the podcast app, please leave a review for the podcast and let me know what you like, what you dislike. Don't go too heavy on the ladder there, please. Otherwise, you'll be there all day. If I don't stop talking, y'all will be here all day as well. So I suppose it's time to talk about these polarizing players. First up on the list is Lamar Jackson, man. Like I said, I might have I might have thought the word polarizing was flashy, but I still think there are arguments to be had for these high-powered quarterbacks and whether or not you should be drafting them early. I mean, in super flex leagues too, obviously, they're like top five picks. So he's coming off the single greatest fantasy season of all time. I could be lying. This chart goes back to 2010, but Lamar Jackson up there, 415.7 points in 15 games. He also played in just 75% of the snaps in four of those games because he sat out the final quarter. So you're talking about a guy who missed the game, who didn't play the final quarter in a quarter of his games that he did play. Actually, more than a quarter because he only played 15 games. A point and a half behind Patrick Mahomes' 2018 season with all that time missed. This is the single greatest pound-for-pound -pound fantasy season by a quarterback. Listen, I've got to pay homage to Michael Vick, but... What we're seeing with Lamar is something that we have never seen before and something we might never, ever see again. Lamar's passing yardage number last year, a little bit over 3,100, which again, I remind you, was his first ever year as a starter, and he missed a lot of time. Basically, the equiv equivalent of two games when you take out the snaps and everything. Vic topped that number one time in his 13-year career. First year as a starter, Lamar Jackson breaks a single-season rushing record for a quarterback, 1,206. It took Vic six years to top the 1,000-yard rushing mark, something he did one time. If you coveted watching Michael Vick, he's the reason I'm a Falcons fan. He's literally the reason that I am indebted to Atlanta, despite the, the embarrassment that they've brought me over the last few years. All I'm saying is Lamar Jackson needs to be cherished right now. And if you drafted him last year, the reason he's on this list is because he was a legitimate league winner. 
I don't care that it was a one quarterback league. He was someone that single-handedly won you one quarterback leagues last year. And that, my friends, is not an opinion. We got the big facts to bike it up. Lamar Jackson, nearly seven fantasy points per game more than the next highest scoring quarterback. That is the same number that C-Mac had over the next highest ranked running back. So to put it easy for you, they were equally valuable in terms of replacement over the next ranking guy at their position. However, there's only 32 possible quarterbacks that can be started in a fantasy league. When it comes to running backs, you could probably throw anywhere from 35 to 50 guys on a weekly basis into your lineup. The lack of options at the position actually makes Lamar Jackson more valuable than Christian McCaffrey was last year. So what happens in 2020? He's a second round pick right now in one quarterback league. He's going off the board, I believe at like the 207 or the 208. Top five for super flex, of course. I cannot argue the ladder, but is he worth the investment in one quarterback leagues, knowing that you can easily roster someone pick 10 rounds later? It really comes down to the fact that do you believe, or the question, do you believe that he is still seven to seven and a half points better than the next replacement quarterback? My answer would be no, because last year, the next highest scoring guy was like Dak Prescott. I think he had 21 and a half points per game. And that is very, very low for the quarterback two on a year over year basis. So typically Lamar Jackson's ridiculous season last year. I don't know if you expect him to regress. You expect him to get better. It was a crazy crazy, crazy year. And I'm sure he's going to be fine again for fantasy this year around the same number. But typically that replacement level will only be three to four points above replacement. Whereas the running back like Christian McCaffrey will continue to give you that type of upside and stellar projection over the next guy, whether it's Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, all those elite running backs kind of give you that mold. So the way I look at it with one quarterback leagues, it's always the question. If you skip out on Lamar Jackson, you're going to be able to get like a running back. Like you're going to be able to get a Josh Jacobs or a Miles Sanders at the 205. Later on in the draft, you can get Carson Wentz in like the ninth or 10th round. So would you rather have Josh Jacobs and Carson Wentz, or would you rather have Lamar Jackson and whatever running back you're going to get in the ninth or 10th round, like a Sonny Michelle or Matt Brady? I think when you look at it that way, it's pretty damn obvious that the way to go here is with later round quarterback the upside running back in the beginning. The likelihood on you hitting on a ninth or 10th round running back is very, very unlikely, but the likelihood of hitting on a quarterback, you don't even have to hit. The reason that quarterbacks go late is because the points per game differential between like a quarterback seven and the quarterback 17 is so small. So your chance of actually not hitting is much greater than the chance of actually hitting on the running back. So it's like all those guys at the end of drafts and one quarterback leagues are extremely safe because even if they don't hit, you drop them, replace them with someone new. That's not something you could do with the running back. So you want the early round running backs. You don't want to sacrifice, right? You might want Lamar Jackson raw, straight up over a guy like Josh Jacobs or whoever it is, right? It's going to put up more fantasy points on the year. But when you look at it from a roster construction relative to what we're seeing in 2020, you're not going to want to do that. So LJAX, maybe back of round three, I'm okay, but round two picks, that's there's way too many pivotal players still on the board. All right, next up, I think this guy actually falls into the polarizing category, and that is A.J. Brown of the Tennessee Titans, the Titians. By definition, polarizing means to divide people. By the sheer force of one's polarizing personality, an individual can unite or divide people. A.J. Brown physically divides people on the football field, and he is virtually dividing people in fantasy football Twitter because with A.J. Brown, you have people that are literally just robots, just repeating his efficiency can't stay the same next year, and that's it. And efficiency must come down, and everything else he's just going to stink at. On the other side, you have people enamored by who A.J. Brown is as a prospect, right? 226 pounds, 44940 yard dash. He's looking like the second coming of Julio or Josh Gordon or Andre Johnson, whatever you want to label him. He's already a Hall of Famer in some people's minds. So let's take a little bit of a deep dive back into 2019. A.J. Brown finished as fantasy's wide receiver 15, catching just 52 passes on 84 targets, 1,051 receiving yards, and eight touchdowns. He was the only wide receiver inside the top 25 fantasy wide receiver with fewer than 90 targets. So his efficiency was out of control. When you look at the splits, though, the 10 games as Ryan Tannehill as a starter on the left side. I mean, you see those numbers. They're ridiculous. It was only 3.8 catches per game. That's where things start to get bumpy. Do we trust the volume for A.J. Brown? And you could start breaking down the individual game logs where it's like 150 yards here, then 30 yards, then 130, then 40. And it was inconsistent, which makes him such a divided fantasy pick. And everything that we're saying in 2020, anything anyone's saying about A.J. Brown in 2020 is is just projections. We know that Tennessee wants to run the ball like crazy. Feed Henry until he literally dies on the field. I feel like for whatever fucked up reason, Tennessee would be okay with Derrick Henry dying on the field. If he was like two years into his new extension and he died on the field, they would be like, yep, that was our uh, press conference would be like, yeah, well, uh, listen, that was, that was, that was our game plan. We don't, we don't pivot. We're a hard nose ground and pound team. And if we got to die on the field to, to prove our point, we're, we're going to do that. And, uh, we, we happen to kill Derek today. So next man up. 
it's really the Derrick Henry death trap here in Tennessee. The playoffs are where things got a little bit ugly. And now playoffs, no one includes them in fantasy, of course. Most people don't even include week 17 statistics. But I think playoffs are like a good indicator of really, you know, when the game is on the line, when the game gets tough, when the games are tight, you're going against good opponents. What is your game plan? What are you going with here? And it was not good for A.J. Brown last year. In three playoff games, I'm going to read off the stats. A.J. Brown caught a total of five passes for 64 yards. He was targeted 10 times. In that same span, Derrick Henry ran the ball 27 times a game for a total of 446 yards on the ground. This is what we are afraid of. That style of play where Ryan Tannehill throws the ball nine or 10 times a game. That's where issues are going to arise with A.J. Brown. However, however, I love A.J. Brown. I love A.J. Brown more than Tennessee loves Derek. I might actually love A.J. Brown more than Tennessee does. Like what Brown did last year, finishing as the number 15 fantasy wide receiver, going over a thousand yards, despite playing on minimal snaps over the first half of the year, was ridiculously impressive. The way I look at it is, okay, the efficiency can come down and the volume might not be there, but he's also an alpha. And when you're an alpha, commanding targets is a skill. And he is someone that's way more than good enough to be able to do that consistently game over game. And there's a possibility that his efficiency numbers just stay really high because he's really fucking good at the game of football. Yeah, his yards perception might not, might not be 20, but guess what? They could still stay up there at 16. What if he just becomes one of the best deep reception guys in the game? What if his yak is not a fluke? What if he's just really good with the ball in his hands? That will keep all those efficiency numbers very high. When you're very good at football, your efficiency numbers tend to be very high. And I think we can all agree that AJ Brown is very, 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 very good at football. He's just not fluky. He's got great downfield speed. He's great with the ball in his hands. There's a reason why he averaged over six 16 yards per reception in college despite playing out of the slot. He's not going to have that first half of the year where he's sitting on the bench for 50% of the snaps. That wasn't established until week nine last year. He will get that for the entirety of the season. It won't surprise me when people look back, AJ Brown blows up this year. People look back and are like, oh, you know, it was the volume argument. Like sometimes dudes are just that good. I also want to throw in from, from Matt Harmon referenced this podcast before he went on a PFF podcast to talk about his work in reception perception and the wide receivers. AJ Brown lined up, right? We talked about in college, he played a lot on the slot when he, he was moved to the outside at one point. I think DK Metcalf got hurt or whatever. And AJ Brown had to move outside and he played really well on the outside too. So we have a sample of him playing in the slot. We have a sample of him playing outside in college. We knew he could move all over the place. Last year, he lined up at X receiver outside on 88% of his routes. His success rate versus man coverage. This is what Matt Harmon had to say about him. He said, as a separator, as a pure wide receiver separator, he's already a class above Anquan Bolden. They're getting a lot of comparisons between AJ Brown and Anquan Bolden. He said in one year, in the one year sample size he looked at, he's already a separator above Anquan Bolden. Like this is just what happens. Good players become great players because they take a step up. Brown's next step up from 1,050 yards, it's going to be 1,300 yards whenever that season happens. I don't know if it's going to be 2020, but it's going to happen. What if he goes from 85 targets to 120 targets this year, from eight touchdowns to 11 touchdowns? This is what happens when you have a rookie who played on 68% of the snaps last year, move to a full-time player and be really, 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 really good. Second year in the league. All I'm saying is if you got multiple drafts, if you want to stay away because you're scared of the regression or whatever the fuck that nonsense is, do it. But if you're in multiple drafts, make sure you leave at least one draft with a share of future Hall of Famer A.J. Brown. Right alongside A.J. Brown is the homie D.K. Metcalf. Now, I broke down D.K. Metcalf in depth. A lot of this analysis is actually straight from the draft guide. If you have not caught the draft guide, it is the single best way to support my work. You know, if you're getting a lot of free value and information from the YouTube videos that we're now putting out six days a week, uh, that is the best way to support it. And you could literally do so. The $10 that you throw into Monkey Knife Fight goes a very, very long way for myself and the brand and being able to feed snacks as pasta six nights a week. So if you go over to monkeyknifefight.com, they're going to get you the draft guides, all of them that we have on the website, absolutely free when you deposit 10 bucks on their website using the promo code BDGE. So go over to monkeyknifefight.com after this, or right fucking now, just open up a new tab. Incredible what the internet allows you to do in terms of flexibility, right? Monkeyknifefight.com, put in 10 bucks, use the promo code BDGE, that will get you access to all of the draft guides. Make sure you play a game on there. Then I'll email you access to the draft guides. It's got the season long draft guide, which is what most of you guys are probably watching for now. At this point, all of my fades for the year, all of my sleep 
sleepers, the undervalued players, the must draft players round by round. We've got the Bible coming out in a couple of weeks, which is literally like a 10,000 word document I put together exactly how to attack the 2020 fantasy football draft. Because as y'all know, I've been doing research for like four months straight and I see the trends that take place and I see what rounds we need to start pushing certain players, when you need to pull the trigger on certain positions. All that is discussed in the Bible. We'll be dropping in two weeks. It's got all of our rankings, of course, too. Principal cheat sheets, et cetera, et cetera. Anything you need for your league, your mans has got you on monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you deposit 10. You're getting this like $70 value absolutely free from there. DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf is far from free in fantasy drafts. At this point, he's starting to go into the fourth-ish round. And his dynasty ADP is almost getting pushed back from his redraft ADP. Like, I, I get it. DK Metcalf's extremely polarizing player. Now, I actually haven't seen or heard many people that don't like him this year. I just think we might be a year early on the real breakout, on the on the fantasy football redraft spectrum of things. We're a year early if we're drafting Metcalf into the fourth round. I'm sure his ADP is only going to continue to rise up because Tyler Lockett is still in town. If it were not for that weird injury he suffered, the bottom leg, whatever the fuck he ended up suffering with, that made him be a decoy for a couple of weeks, Tyler Lockett was well on his way to finishing as a top 10 wide receiver. Like Metcalf had, uh, you know, proved the doubt was wrong, had a phenomenal rookie year by all accounts, but people are acting like, you know, he was a, a wide receiver too, like the wide receiver 22 or something. And now he's, now he's about to take the jump up to the wide receiver 10 or something. Like, I hate to break it to you, but he was the wide receiver 41 in points per game last year among the wide receiver position. Minimum of 10 games played. He was the wide receiver 41. And now he's being drafted as a mid wide receiver too, where you are giving up a lot of really, really good proven players in offenses that are not run first, that don't have someone who's been operating as the wide receiver one in that offense already. I do think Metcalf will continue to develop as a player. Look at where AJ Brown's situation is, right? They're both on run heavy offenses. The problem is this would be like AJ Brown having to compete with a really good secondary wide. Like imagine, imagine Tyler Lockett was in Tennessee. Imagine Corey Davis wasn't terrible. Imagine Stefan Diggs was in Tennessee. Like that would be a lot scarier drafting AJ Brown, but he has no one else to compete with in terms of targets coming into this year. Lockett is still, still, still very, very, very much there. I just don't see an upside for a guy like Metcalf to overtake the target lead there. Like I don't see Metcalf going off for 130 targets while Lockett scales down to like 80. I think we've seen that Russell Wilson really trusts Tyler Lockett there. They did let him run a more diverse route tree as the second half broke and they'll probably continue to do so. But all the tight ends were down. And prior to that, Russell Wilson targeted the tight ends in the red zone and in the end zone at a ridiculously high rate. And when they all got hurt, it seemed like it was Metcalf's job to be that guy down there. So I don't know if the numbers that he had were actually like predictive in terms of how they want to play or how they want to use him. I'm having a lot of trouble seeing the upside here. So maybe someone proved me wrong in the comment section. Why is DK Metcalf worth a fourth round pick if he's just going to go off for a thousand yards or 1100 yards, which is not a terrible landing point, but I just don't see a ceiling in 2020. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. And then next year he's a second round pick or some shit, but I don't see it. All right, let's move over to the final player on this list. Jonathan Taylor. I have not really spoken in depth about Jonathan Taylor running back from Indy second round pick their second second round pick after Michael Pittman is currently going off the board as the 38th pick running back 19 right after the third round ends. That is when you have to scoop Taylor. If you want Taylor, you're likely going to have to go into the third round, the back of the third round to get him. And that is just it's, it's very, 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 very high. I understand why people love Jonathan Taylor. One of the best pure running backs to come out of college, possibly ever. Three years at Wisconsin, three years of over 2,000 yards from scrimmage, nearly 1,000 touches during that three-year span. Some people will get nervous about the touches. I have zero, zero problem with him having those touches on his resume. And that's because he never dealt with injuries. Like I'd much rather see a guy handle that workload and show us that he is capable of not getting injured and hand handling the workload at one, a healthy level, also an efficient level, which is what he did all three years. So give me that over a guy who's never proven that he can handle a workload like Jonathan Taylor's eight out of seven days a week. The other thing that kind of jumps out here on his box score is going into his final year at Wisconsin, we had questions about his passing game chops, right? But he did more than enough to me to prove that he's got that part of the game if it's given to him at the next level. That 26 catch season in 2019, good enough for me. And even more promising is the 9.7 yards per, per reception. He's explosive. He's a baller with the rock in his hand. But that if given to him at the next level is going to be massive. This is a great tweet from Ian Harditz. Danny Woodhead, 2015, the running back three is the only top 20 PPR running back under Frank Wright 
as OC or head coach. And that is a six year sample size. Now, obviously that's not predictive, but it is an interesting fact nonetheless. Here's the way I, I kind of put it into perspective. First of all, the sports books at FanDuel and DraftKings have Jonathan Taylor's over under set at 700. His rushing yardage, sorry, his rushing yardage set at 700 for this year. That should be a little bit of a sobering thought for you guys. If Taylor somehow finished the year with like 1,300 yards from scrimmage, like you knew that, where would you be drafting him? Because that's what Miles Sanders did last year. We knew he wasn't going to command the touches right away. He was in a, a backfield where they were going to use a running back by committee, but he exploded over the second half of the season. And by all accounts, if Taylor ends up finishing with the 2020 Miles Sanders numbers, you'd be ecstatic. But Sanders was going off the board around like round six or round seven, not round three. And I also think an easier projection if we pivot from Miles Sanders to actually Josh Jacobs. If you look at what Josh Jacobs did, maybe that's more realistic for Jonathan Taylor. Great for a rookie by all means. But Jacobs got a lot of groundwork, not much in the passing game. And that's what we could probably expect from Jonathan Taylor in his rookie year, except Jacobs, one, had the first round draft capital. Two, they inserted him into a workhorse role immediately. Having that immediate workhorse role is what propelled Jacobs to the RB15. He finished as the RB15 in points per game last year. Yes, I know he missed time. Points per game, Josh Jacobs was the RB15. Like the first game they had, 24 touches for Josh Jacobs. And I remember that very first Monday Night Football game. Shit had me looking stupid. It had me in my bag. It had me in my fields. I was like, shit, I'm never going to work another day in this town but here's the problem i think taylor doesn't get that josh jacobs role until like week six or seven so you're drafting taylor right now he's going off at like rb 18 or 19 but you're probably not getting the rb 15 points per game stuff until a month two months into the season and at that point you have to ask yourself is it is it worth it is jonathan taylor you know better than marlon mack yes sure but this isn't madden it's not just a plug and play the colts trust marlon mack as their running back i mean marlon mack is not Peyton Barber. He rushed for over a thousand yards last year. Here's a list of guys that outrushed Marlon Mack on the season last year. It was Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb, Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, Chris Carson, Leonard Fournette, Josh Jacobs, Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook. Those are the only nine names that had more rushing yards last year than Marlon Mack. Marlon Mack played in 14 games. Had he played in 16, I was looking at the numbers, had he played in a full 16 going off his points per or his rushing yards per game, he would have flirted, been right underneath Chris Carson for those top five numbers. Case in point, Mac is not just a guy. Maybe he's not great, but he's not someone that I think gets shoved to the side. And more importantly, that's all we're hearing out of Indianapolis, right? Colts coach Frank Wright envisioned second rounder Jonathan Taylor and Marlon Mack serving as a one-two punch. Colts OC Nick Sirianni said the RB room is a one-one punch with Marlon Mack and Jonathan Taylor, which Frank Wright admitted there's definitely inherent respect for the starting returner when asked about the team's backfield and running back Marlon Mack. And you might, you might not believe him, but I'm not really sure why. They keep saying it over and over. The other problem I see is that even if Taylor does take over the groundwork do we see enough work in the passing game to justify you know if you're if you're if you're picking him in the third round it's like it's completely based on projections of him beating out everyone in the backfield and getting a monster workload third round running back picks are guys that you think have the upside to land in the top five as the rb18 rb19 a guy that probably has very 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 lowered ceiling in the passing game and we don't know what his actual role on the ground is what if he gets 10, 12 carries a game? What if he just gets 13 carries over the first 18 weeks, eight weeks of the season, excuse me, or the first fucking 18 weeks of the season? Maybe that's what happens in his first year. That I think is a very, very, very risky pick in the third round, in the fourth round. So Taylor's a guy I do really want shares of because he's so polarizing, but not at the price point he's currently at. Next year, top five overall pick, sure. But as an early pick right now, just too high upside, high risk for me personally. I want to know that the guys I'm picking in the first three to four rounds of a redraft league are the guys that I can depend on to get me 12 to 20 points a game week in, week out. Because if one of those guys falls through, you're putting yourself in a very, very bad situation, a bad position relative to the other league mates. Okay, so we talked about Lamar. We talked about AJB. We talked about Metcalf. We talked about Jonathan Taylor. Who are some other polarizing guys that you think uh, maybe I'll make a part two of this video if you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, make sure you hit the button that looks like this. It's a thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you're new. That's that's what lets me know that you did enjoy these videos. You can comment down below what other kind of videos you would like to see as well. Again, the best way to support the brand is heading over to monkeyknifefight.com using the promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10 bucks, play a game on there. And then within 24 hours, I will email you access to the beautiful, beautiful draft guide that has about a billion more big facts than the videos that I put out do. But it's just an organized way to get all of my thoughts and a beautiful way to support the brand. I love y'all. I'll see you manana. Adios.